Reading will start shortly. The proceeding 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 will start shortly.
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly.
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. Order. Before we start the debate, I want to say something about the exceptional heat. While the heat remains at this level, I'm content for members not to wear jackets or tie in, ties in Westminster Hall. Uh, the Speaker announced similar arrangements for the Chamber. But when the House returns in autumn, Mr Speaker and the deputies will expect members to revert to wearing a jacket and will also strongly encourage male members to wear ties when speaking in the chamber and here in Westminster Hall. So, without any further ado, I move that um, Marsha de, de Cordova uh, to, to move the motion. Marsha. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 592642 relating to funding for BTEC qualifications. And can I say, Sir Mark, it is a pleasure once again to serve under your chairmanship. The petition, protect student choice, do not withdraw funding for BTEC qualifications, aims to provide, aims to reverse the plan to withdraw funding for most applied general qualifications such, such as BTECs and guarantee they will continue to play a major role in the qualifications landscape. The petition is about choice and not forcing students to choose between only studying A-levels or T-levels from the age of 16. I would like to begin by acknowledging and congratulating the Protect Student Choice Coalition, which is an unprecedented gathering of 30 organisations from various sectors, including the Association of School and College Leaders, the National Teachers' Union and the National Union of Students for its brilliant campaigning against the defunding of BTECs. The strong level of support, including the petition gathering over 108,329 signatures, which has led to, the, to today's debate, is credit to the brilliant work by the coalition, and in, in particular to the petition's creators, Nooney and James, at the Sixth Form Colleges Association. The fact that the government has had to make changes to its plans, although these changes still do not go far enough, shows the power of the work of the coalition and the value of this petition. I'd also like to say special thanks to St Francis Xavier and South Thames College in my Battersea constituency, which are two brilliant institutions providing BTECs for young people in Battersea and neighbouring constituencies. So Mark, many of us here today, we are here because we strongly believe and are passionate about ensuring the education system provides young people with the skills employers need. And as we come out of the pandemic, we need students to finish education, well equipped to progress to further training or to get skilled jobs, allowing businesses to recover and young people to flourish. And that is why I am extremely concerned about the government's proposal to remove funding for the vast majority of BTECs, as this will mean they will remove choice for many young people and will lead to some potentially missing the opportunity and the chance to go to university. Do you remember give way, please? 
Thank you. Thank you. That's a choice. That's what we want our students to have, right? Yeah. Thank you. I'll give way to my other friend. Thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to, share, to sit under your chairmanship, Mr. Henrik, the first time. And I, I congratulate the Honourable Member for Battersea, a dear friend of mine, for securing this debate today. BTEX have been a lifetime lifeline to so many of my constituents across St. Helens and Knowsley. They have a positive impact on social mobility and have helped so many young people get on in life. Does my honourable friend agree with me that BTEX offer the right balance of academic and vocational uh, learning and that funding for them must be maintained? I want to congratulate my honourable friend on her point. She's clearly read my speech before I have because I'm actually going to come on to those points and she's absolutely uh, spot on. And that's why I was proud to join over 100 parliamentarians calling on the government to reconsider its plan. I will give friend. Give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and she's right. That we, one of the things we want to promote, of course, is choice. And I completely agree with the point she's making about scrapping BTEX, hindering social mobility, hindering process into skilled labour markets and into higher education. But also, as Paul Britton, the principal of White Sixth Form College, which I'm a bit biased about, I went there myself as a student, as he pointed out, it'll also have an impact on the local economy as well. So not only is this bad for social mobility, it's bad for choice, it's also bad for the local economy. And I support BTEC so much that even my daughter is going to be doing one uh, next year. Fantastic. And I couldn't say it better myself. My honourable friend makes a fantastic contribution and she is absolutely right. It's not just about social mobility, it's about the local economy as well. Now, the introduction of T-levels do have value in terms of technical education. However, there is no rationale as to why BTEC qualifications <coughs> must make way for them. It makes sense to have... A-levels, T-levels and BTECs in all future qualification landscapes. And it is clear that the government is forcing through these changes so it can drive up T-level take-up, as the Sixth Form College Associations has described. T-levels as a minority, untested product that the government is pushing as a mass product. Now, it's still too early to analyse the effectiveness of T-levels, and the government should be shouldn't be pulling away from BTEX without evidence about the success of T-levels. And this is grossly unfair to young people by removing their choice and opportunity. Now, the notion is wrong that you can divide people into academic or technical. BTEX provide a different type of educational experience, one that combines the development of skills with academic learning. And I also believe the minister responding today studied a BTEC and said that it was a transformative impact on her life. I am sure the Minister might agree with me that we will need a new BTEC course on public anger management after last week. Now leaders from various education institutions have also said that BTECs will continue to be more will continue to be a more effective route to higher education or skilled employment for some students as opposed to those studying for a levels or T levels. I I will yes. It's very kind of her. Um, I, I am very fortunate to have Peter Simmons College in my constituency. It's one of the biggest in England. So and they educate about four and a half thousand young people, and many of their students progress to higher education or to, to skilled employment after studying the the AGQ, such as BTEC. So would the honourable lady agree that what we need to hear from the new minister today, who are welcome to her place, that if the government is to proceed with this policy and remove BTEC, what is the viable pathway that they envisage for those young people who are going to then want to move on to higher education or skilled employment through colleges such as Peter Simmons serving my constituents and many of the MPs around me in Hampshire? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for, for his contribution and it's important that we retain the routes. I think the three routes that currently are available should be retained. In particular, BTEX provide a good route into getting young people into university. And the Nutfield Foundation found that around a quarter of students that go to university have BTEC qualifications and a significant amount of those students complete their studies successfully, with 60% graduating with at least an upper second class degree. Now the government must be listening to students, as it is clear from the data that students value these qualifications. An estimate suggests that around 34% 
of the 921,046 16 to, 16 to 18 year olds studying a level three quali qualification in England are pursuing at least one BTEC. Now some of the benefits of BTECs include, and I will share some experiences of what students have said. So first, BTECs allow students to specialise and learn a wider range of skills. Isabella, who was, a, who was studying for a BTEC in IT at SFX Sixth Form College, said, if I was to do an A-level computer science, I would have to pick up two other subjects that weren't related to my chosen career path. I would like to do something in artificial intelligence or computer science or web, or web developing. And I realised that me doing VTech IT really benefits me as I study a lot of these areas in my course. Now second, VTechs are more accessible than alternatives such as T-levels. Summer, who is a level three aviation operations student at Newcastle College said, many people won't meet the qualifications to go on to T-levels and everyone deserves an education no matter what grades they get. Third, BTECs also lead to beneficial health outcomes, including on mental health. Sylvia, who is studying art, design and communications at St. Francis Xavier's College said, I don't need to worry about exams or any tests. I'm just in the moment. I design buildings and I build them. Not everybody is cut out to just do all exams. The reality is that the plan for T-levels and A-levels to become the qualifications of choice for most young people will leave many students without a viable pathway after their GCSEs, including those with special education needs or disabilities and those from a black Asian or ethnic minority backgrounds. Now, the, the Department for Education's own impact assessment concluded that these students had the most to lose from these changes. Now, defunding BTEX risks reversing the progress made by higher education institutions, especially in London, regarding access and participation in recent years. VTECs are engines of social mobility, as has been highlighted by Honourable Friends. And research from the Social Market Foundation found that 44% of white working class students that enter university studied at least one VTEC. And 37% of black students enter with only one VTEC qualification. Now the government has now said that it plans to delay the defunding to 2024-25 rather than in 2023-24 and that its plans will only apply to a small proportion of the total level 3 BTEC and ever apply general style qualifications. However, on the first point, delaying a bad idea does not stop it from being a bad idea and on the second, removing a small proportion of qualifications that a high proportion of students are enrolled on will still have a devastating impact. For example, in the sixth form college sector, around 80% of applied general enrolments are in just 20 subject areas. So it is time, Sir Mark, for the government to listen and it needs to consider reversing its plans. Therefore, when the minister responds, I would like to know whether she thinks the new prime minister will change this party's disastrous policy on this issue. And will she guarantee that funding will not be removed for any BTEC qualifications unless there is an impartial evidence-based assessment that has concluded that it is not valued by students, universities and indeed employers? And will she ensure that students and practitioners can contribute to the process of identifying qualifications that are deemed to overlap with these T-levels? And can she also assure us that some of the most popular BTECs in subjects like health, business, IT and applied sciences will not be scrapped through reapprovals processes? Simply to help drive up the numbers of students taking T-levels. Now in conclusion, Sir Mark, I know the government... Yes. John Speller. Later, it's not just in London that uh, these have proved so useful. In the West Midlands conurbation, again with a very diverse, uh, diverse population, 
but also with a sizable skills gap in the, in the area. This is why surely the government should be looking at BTEX alongside T-levels. T-levels have a huge role to play and employer demand is there. But employers also recognise the upgrading in the skills and abilities of young people through, under, through undertaking BTEC. So it's not just on the educational side, it's also actually on what we should be, what the government always say they're looking at, which is the outputs, which is actually what employers value as well. Well, my friend, you're absolutely spot on there. So in conclusion, Sir Mark, I know the government argues that changes are needed and that its plans are about streamlining and improving the quality of post-16 qualifications. However, I know, along with others, I'm firmly in a disagreement with its assessment and don't believe that the reforms will achieve their desired outcomes. Now, the government needs to listen. It's not just listening to me, but listening to the students, to practitioners, to employers who all see the value of retaining these BTEC qualifications. And it really is time that the government changes direction. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 592642 relating to BTEC qualifications. I now go call Rebecca Powell. Thank you uh, so much, Sir Mark, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Now I'm back on the back benches, uh, having been one of the 56 who was driven to resign. Um, I, I think it demonstrates, uh, Sir Mark, that I feel this is so important to speak in this debate that this is the first thing I've actually come out to speak on. And I do that for a number of reasons. I think it's important nationally in terms of this qualification that we're talking about. Uh, but also, it's very important for my own constituency of Taunton Dean, because I have a number of really excellent FE colleges, and I'll mention them in a minute. But I actually had 669 signatories on this petition, and I'm very pleased to follow the Honourable Member from Battersea who, who did the opening. Um, and that is, that's eighth in the table of number of people from their constituencies. So it is genuinely, and normally when you get that many uh, people signing a petition, it normally demonstrates, in fact, there are probably lots of others uh, who support this, this whole subject as well. So that's why I'm here. Um, and to cut to the chase, um, I obviously understand the need to equip students uh, between 16 and 18, uh, or indeed those studying in later life, um, so that we best uh, give them the best skills and tools to get into jobs, uh, to, to, to work with the businesses that really need them, uh, and that's really important and really important to grow our economy. So in that respect, I, I did support, obviously, the bill, the, um, the Skills and uh, Post-16 Education Bill, but I, but I do have real concerns about the proposal to basically axe what I would consider is the perfectly well-functioning qualification um, of the BTEC. And, um, and, and, and in a large pr proportion of cases, I, you know, I think they're functioning really well. I completely understand it would be worth looking at the multiparies range of courses because probably quite clearly some of them are repetitive and some of them are not quite aligning to the jobs and skills we need, but certainly a great many of them are, and, um, and, and I certainly don't believe that they should just be removed and you're, uh, so that one is only left with the T-levels and the A-levels, and I perfectly understand their place as well, uh, but it would seem rather like throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, to get rid of something that's actually already performing uh, well. And uh, of, of course I give way for giving way. She's making an excellent speech. Just on the point around T-levels, I hope the Minister will recognise that those T-levels aren't universally available throughout the country because of the workplace uh, placement requirement that comes with them. So actually getting rid of BTEX to replace them with T-levels is limiting choice for people because it's very variable and dependent on the jobs that they have in the local economy. Yeah. That's actually a really good point. That, what, that wasn't raised by my area because it may not be the case, but certainly the case has been raised that T-levels are basically the equivalent of three A-levels being rolled together. You know, and not every student is quite ready to do that. Uh, and indeed, they have to get the same qualifications in GCSE to go to do a T-level. So already, to my mind, one might be alienating um, a certain number of students who have found the BTEC a really good way. They might go on to do some of these other things. So, so I think there are, there are many things that I would really urge the Minister, uh, to be, who I welcome to her place, um, to, to be looking at, to be listening, um, now that actually... Uh, we've got this reprieve, um, and I, of course I'll give away to the Shadow Minister. Um, very quickly, 
Toby Perkins. Uh, to the Honourable Lady from Taunton Dean for giving way, and I think she's hitting upon a really important point. If the government are saying that T levels have greater rigour than BTEX, and if by definition there's going to be many students who currently do BTEX for whom T levels won't be appropriate, the government absolutely has to tell us what their plan is for those students. If it isn't going to be a level three qualification, what is the plan for them? I thank him for that, and I, I'm not always the first person to be agreeing with the opposition benches, um, but I actually think we've got a lot of synergy here, because I think, I think what, what is most important is putting the students first uh, and coming up with what, what we can do for them, and then, in, you know, in fairness, how they can help the country and the economy, because they're well-trained and they've got the right skills. So I know that we've got this reprieve, um, but I believe at the moment it's only a delay, and what I would urge the Minister... Um, uh, is that she uses this delay to listen to all of these comments and to actually work out what sort of a system we might have so that we could keep all three of the qualifications uh, in the right shape or form. Of course I will. Steve Bryan. Regardless of the intervention that I made before on the Honourable Lady opening the debate, if the government wishes to proceed with this, then that is, that is, its, that is its right to do so if it can convince the House that it's the right thing to do. But young people who've had enough anxiety over the last few years are making decisions now. They don't have time for delay and naval gaze. So we do actually need a steer sooner rather than later because otherwise it's just adding to their anxiety. Uh, I thank him for that. And yes, of course, I think we all recognise that this very difficult time that our students have have come through uh, and that and, and indeed also the colleges in planning um, do need um, some clear steers so I think that's a point well made. I just wanted to pivot now to speak very specifically about my own sixth form college called Richard Hughes's College which is um, it's, it's been rated outstanding by Offset for the third consecutive year and it's, it's, uh, it's got an outstanding record actually over 20 years and nearly 800 students every year do uh, these applied general qualifications, i.e. BTECs, um, and with, a, with a, a significant number of them then going on to very high quality education and a whole range of other courses. So they're definitely a really, really useful stepping stone, and I've been speaking to them, and many of the points I'm about to raise actually have come in discussion, from discussion with them. But I just wanted to highlight some of the examples um, so, for example, one student did two A-levels, uh, psychology and sociology, and then she did the B-tech in music production. She's gone on to Magdalen College in Oxford to do human science. And then we've got... Um, the yes, of course I will. Uh, that's a really call. important part, uh, a point regarding the fact that B-tech can go in and get you to be able to go to university at Oxford and Cambridge, but actually Oxford and Cambridge will not... Um, recognise the T-level subjects. Mm. Okay, well, there is another very well, <laughs> well-made point. Um, and, you know, I think all these things have got to go into the mix in, in just making sure we do get this right for our young people. Another example, um, the BTEC, um, a student studied the um, extended diploma in public service, has gone on to do paramedic science at the University of Plymouth. Another one did the business BTEC. Uh, they've gone on to do a higher level apprenticeship with Ernst & Young, the accountants. Um, another did the um, extended diploma in public services. They've gone to join Avon and Somerset Police. Uh, and then another one did health and social care, and they've gone on to ad an adult nursing degree at Cardiff University. A further one did health and social care diploma, has gone on to do a teaching course at Plymouth University, and, um, and so on and so forth. So I think this just demonstrates the breadth of the course, and also there's a really strong link, particularly in my constituency, with students doing a health-related BTEC and then going into nursing. And um, this is absolutely critical. We've got another really good FE college, the University Centre of Somerset. Many of them, and they do in fairness T levels and BTECs and all going well, but they, they take a lot of these students onto their nursing courses. And we need them. We need these people in Somerset. We probably need them all over the country. But we really need them in Somerset because we've got this wonderful new um, hospital that I, as the MP, have been responsible for helping to get the um, upgrade and the new theatres, and we're working on that. But there's a massive call for more nurses, and we want the nurses also, Sir Mark, to stay in my lovely constituency. You know, so if we can train them there and they can get a great job, uh, well paid, they're not going to we're not going to hemorrhage them all to 
elsewhere in the country. We actually do need them to play, stay in Somerset, and particularly because we've got an ageing population, and I'd like my young people to stay in this wonderful constituency. Of course, I'll give way. Rachel Hopkins. It's so important that that practical link-up is maintained. Would she not agree? I thank her for that intervention, and it's exactly the point that I was trying to make. And we're demonstrating that is what's happening in Somerset, and uh, I would certainly like to see it, uh, some art, continue to happen, uh, and in fact to grow, and that we nurture all these people to live and work in this wonderful, it's a beautiful environment in which to work anyway, uh, so we can give them a good job as well and good training. They will, I am sure, be tempted to stay. Uh, and, and that is particularly um, important. So we've got a, w w there's also a significant number of people also going into teaching uh, as being demonstrated from these courses. So I think that's very, very important as well. Uh, so I would say that um, there are a lot of concerns of moving from this binary system of T levels and A levels and that that will, that will actually mean that um, our BTECs become defunded. Uh, and I'd like assurances from the minister uh, that this will not be the case. Uh, and for many young people, um, it, it, it will be much more appropriate, as, I, as I've said, for them to start potentially with the, with the BTEC. Um, and also, I, I, um, I just think to, to the point that was raised over here by my honourable friend, um, we, we want our students to have a viable pathway. And, and we, I think that point about the uncertainty was, was such a good one, um, because they will already be thinking, oh, BTEC's the way for me, having that confidence, because it's not three A-levels rolled into one. And, and suddenly they're all getting a bit uncertain about what, what we're doing for them. Uh, and the point about the disadvantaged backgrounds, which was made, I think, very ably by the Honourable Member from Bassey and others, uh, is really significant, because the data shows that there's a really high proportion of people from disadvantaged backgrounds who start with a BTEC, and actually loads of them go on to university, and the universities know this, uh, and we're trying to level up, aren't we? We're trying to, um, to, to, to include everybody. So I do think, Minister, that's really something that needs to be uh, taken into account. And there's just one further point that I wanted to make, and it's particularly significant to Somerset. We have a very high proportion of SMEs in our county, and uh, they simply can't uh, provide the 45 days of work experience uh, that is required for a T-level. And I really understand why that's important uh, and why that's been designed into a T-level. But, you know, they're not huge big companies, mostly, in, in Somerset. They're small SMEs, and a lot of them find it even difficult to give somebody a week's work experience. So I do think, Minister, if, uh, that is really something that I think a lot of attention needs to be given to, uh, because otherwise, we, you know, even the T-levels will struggle uh, in Somerset. Uh, so what we don't want to do is be left with a whole load of brilliant young students uh, where A-levels aren't appropriate, a T-level's not appropriate, uh, and they're just not getting the opportunities that they, they need. So just to conclude, uh, Minister, um, I really, my, my plea is, please look at this really carefully, listen to what everybody's saying. I think we're all saying it with the best intentions uh, behind what we're saying. We want to support the government in its skills and opportunities agenda. That's absolutely the right way to go. Really good to be looking at all this. But please, could we um, potentially have an evidence-based assessment um, of, of this whole situation um, and so that um, we're doing the right thing for our young people? Thank you. I call Mick Whitley. It's a pleasure to serve in the Chairman's And I'm also uh, very grateful to my honourable friend, the member for Battersea, for leading this debate and for speaking with char characteristic eloquence about what the government's plans to defund applied general qualifications will mean for young people living in their constituency. Like here, I've been deeply moved by the many messages that I've received in recent weeks from students studying at Whittle Metropolitan College, urging me to speak in this debate and to stand up in defence of the principle of student, cho student choice. Many of these young people live in some of the most deprived communities in the country, and they understand all too well what this government does not. That guaranteeing young people access to a wide range of educational opportunities is essential if they are to realize their full potential. 
That's a message that has been underscored by many of my older constituency, now working in sectors as diverse as academia, administration and aerospace, for whom BTECs were a vital stepping stone towards university or training in industry. And while much of today's discussion will understandably focus on pathways to work or further study, we must never forget that education is all about broadening one's horizons in other senses. Because while much of what a person studies aged 17 and 18 has little bearing on their day-to-day -day work, it nevertheless plays an important role in shaping more well-rounded, thoughtful and inquisitive adults. Since the Conservative came into office 12 long years ago, educational policy has been treated as a plaything for policymakers who have little grounding in the sector and who are more interested in ideology than outcomes. Rhetoric has trumped hard-earned experience and successive education secretaries have been free to make far-reaching reforms despite the protestations of educa educational experts, practitioners and the young people themselves. The result of that is that today's level of social mobility are in free foil. Free fall, sorry. While the UK continues to lag far behind our European neighbours when it comes to investments in technical training and education. Now, ministers want to do away with a system of qualifications that are wildly respected, recognised and understood, and to replace them with sea levels that are entirely untried and untested. For many people working in further education, these plans will undoubtedly revive memories of the ill-fated vocational diplomas and A-levels but where they served only to distract government from attending to the more profound question concerning education provision, I fear that these new proposals will have the far graver consequence of entrenching long-standing educational inequalities for years to come. Indeed, the UCU has warned that by limiting student choice to a traditional academic education or a narrower vocational pathway, we risk giving rise to an overlooked middle of learners who are unable to access either. For far too long, government's approach towards education policy have been warped by a grotesque desire to preserve a privileged education for the elite few and by the belief that university is now somehow innately superior to a vocational education. The consequence of that is that vocational education is today poorly understood even by ministers who seek to reform it. Ministers have fundamentally failed to grasp the fact that not any, everyone studying a vocational subject wishes to enter an occupational role nor should they be expected to commit such a significant decision at such a young age. And so the education unions are quite right to fear that the government's plans for T-level risks forcing some students who would otherwise study BTECs into lower levels of learning or out of education entirely. Mr Chairman, our country faces some extraordinary challenges in the coming years. The landscape of work is set to be fundamentally transformed by the growing pace of automation while the extent existential threat posed by the climate crisis demands that we invest in an unprecedented level in laying the foundations of a high-skilled and green economy. These all have enormous implications for the future of education provision, and in particular for vocational education. We are in desperate need of a rethink of our priorities and a clean break with the idea that a vocational education is somehow second-rate. But instead of showing the vision, ambition and commitment to fundamentally change that the times call for, ministers are instead focusing on repackaging technical qualifications and restricting student choice. In the short term, it's young working class people in my constituent who will suffer, but soon enough, our whole country will be forced to pay the price. Thanks, Chair. I call Flick Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr. Mark, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship for the first time. Uh, can I also thank um, the Honourable Lady, the Member for Battersea and the Petition Committee for scheduling this debate. This is an important petition which has attracted many signatures from my Mian Valley constituency and elsewhere in Hampshire, where we're fortunate to have some really strong colleges serving our students, although I actually don't have a sixth form college in my constituency, but do, constituents do go to my, um, my Honourable Friends constituency in Winchester and, and other ones around. In this lead-up to the debate, I've been contacted directly by student constituents who have concerns, and I'm pleased to speak on their behalf here too. In the post-COVID landscape, we must help students catch up, as well as ensure that education meets the changing needs of employers and the future life of young people. One thing I know is that employers look for is certainty. 
There has been an endless debate about the value of qualifications and how well qualifications relate to what employers need, which is why I wrote a paper on assessment nearly two years ago and why there have been five commissions since on the subject. And I'll come on to that later. In fact, tomorrow we're setting up an APPG on assessment if anybody's interested in joining. With BTEC, we have a proven qualification in many subjects which provides value to everyone, students and employers. Qualifications like BTEC are taken close to the point at which many students are likely to enter work. They're relatively more important than A-levels to young people who are not going to university as they prepare well for work immediately, whereas university students have another three or four years before facing career-level employers for the first time after graduating. And I'm pleased that most universities do recognise BTECs as a mix of qualifications for entry to university. And I didn't know about T-levels, and I've looked it up, and you're absolutely right. Um, Cambridge and Oxford are not accepting T-levels at this stage, but I do hope that might change. I welcome the intentions towards employability skills, which the government showed in bringing in T-levels, but where BTEC qualifications best fit the needs of students and employ employers, they should be retained. <coughs> so let us take nursing and healthcare, for instance. All the medical bodies have said they are concerned about the impact of scrapping BTEC courses on their ability to recruit in future. Students who take BTECs go on to become sport workers, but many go on to, be, to qualify as nurses, midwives or radiographers. NHS employers estimate that around a fifth of those studying for a nursing degree will have started out with a health and social care BTEC. At the same time, NHS body, uh, bodies have doubts about the viability of replacement T-levels because it requires, as we've just heard, a 45-day work placement, which many employers will struggle to offer. And I know it's also a problem for people who want to go into medicine too, trying to find some work experience. It's very difficult. Ending BTECs without having a suitable replacement will make it hard to recruit into these professions and others, including apprenticeships. So we must ensure that every route into these jobs is kept open. We should also look at the social impact of the proposed changes. We know from the Equalities Impact Assessment, which formed part of the government's response to the consult consultation, that removing BTECs will mean that some students do not attain a qualification at level three. There is simply a commitment to mitigate against this with a higher quality level at level two, and the outline mitigations to support continued progression to level three. Yet it's not clear what those mitigations will be. And the EIA is concerned about the uncertainty of the future approval criteria. I think honourable members will agree that to, to expect students to start on a path when neither they nor the government knows where it's going to lead is unacceptable, and my, which was very well articulated by my honourable friend, for Taunton Dean. The EIA is clear that students from minority and more deprived backgrounds will be disproportionately affected by this, and it's not good enough to say we'll make a better level two for them. That is not how we advance social mobility. I think what this education should teach us, it, it, sorry, what this experience should teach us is that the structure of senior education assessment is becoming more confused, not less. We have A-levels for the academic strands, completely separate from vocational strands. T-levels do not provide learning in some subjects as the same way as BTEC does. And we're proposing to end BTEC in general while retaining some specialist qualifications. So as I've mentioned before in my paper, which I wrote, it's really time to look at again how we structure education between 14 and 18 so that young people can work towards a range of qualifications which, which complement each other. And by that I mean education and vocational, all, all um, people able to do whichever strand they want to do, but at the same time. We should end the situation where young people take GCSEs, which are only a milestone in their education, before moving into confused offer of A-levels and T-levels, and what other limited qualifications remain outside, uh, outside those after this review. And we do need a vocational path alongside T-levels. All the commissions that have published agree with me that our assessment system is no longer fit for purpose. One of the best innovations in education in decades has been the introduction of university technical colleges. Many of my students go to, uh, many of my constituents go to one in Portsmouth, and I'd love to have more surrounding my constituency because the demand for UTCs in, in, Hampshire, in Hampshire places outstrips the supply. That is the right kind of environment for young people to take in a mixture of subjects and qualifications. By starting at 14, they, evolve, they avoid a jolt in their education at 16, although they do do GCSE, it's, it's sort of a secondary, um, a secondary thing, it's just something they have to get through rather than actually uh, linking into what they want to do. Absolutely. Steve Byrne.
making a very thoughtful speech. And of course, because in Hampshire we have a tertiary system where we have big sixth form colleges and very few sixth forms attached to state secondary schools, this is a very important element of choice that maintains that system that's worked well and served our county and our constituents for many, many years. Uh, you're absolutely right, and that shouldn't stop a curriculum which starts at 1420, and it just means that you continue it in a different building, perhaps with a different uniform, but it's, it's a way of, of um, progressing, um, and, and it's very, it, it is very easy to do. Um, it shouldn't, shouldn't be a barrier to changing to a different sort of curriculum. Um, it, it also means that you would have a much more coherent education as well. And then they would be able to go into the workplace, further training or higher education, properly equipped with a wide range of experience. And when I'm talking about a bit like an English baccalaureate, but um, we, I don't think we should call it baccalaureate, and I've spoken about this many times, uh, um, but I won't speak about it now. Um, employers, teachers and students in my constituency all tell me that we should have a meaningful reform of senior education, and I agree with them. The present situation with BTEC, as this petition emphasises, is one which must avoid happening again. Thank you, Sir Mark. Well, Hopkins. Congratulate my friend, Honourable Member for Battersea, for uh, leading with an excellent speech on this petitions debate, and also to the Protect Student Choice Coalition for their excellent campaigning on this issue. I'm a proud former student and now governor of Luton Sixth Form College, the UK's first sixth form college, which now educates over 3,000 students. And I'm also pleased to be co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Sixth Form Education. And so I'd also like to extend my thanks in particular to Sixth Form Colleges Association for all their hard work in this area too. Every student deserves a first-class education. And I know that giving students choice to shape their learning and assessment and career path is critical to them achieving their future asp aspirations successfully. But the government's proposals seem to fly in the face of this. Protect Student Choice estimate that at least 34% of the 16 to 18 year olds studying at level three qualification in England are pursuing at least one applied general qualification, over 300,000 students. And many young people will be better served studying an applied general qualification like a BTEC rather than an A-level or T-level only study programme. It should not be run one route or another, over yeah. another. Yeah. The three route model could, would work well. This is why I and the over 108,000 people who signed the petition are steadfast in our opposition to the government's plan to defund BTEX. Working class people in my town should not be held back by the short-sighted narrowing of opportunities. BTECs have transformed the life chances of thousands of young people in Luton and made a significant, significant contribution to our local economy. As well as numerous examples of young people in Luton pursuing their aspirations through BTECs, <coughs> and whether that be work, further qualifications or university, this is also backed by research. And I've made this point many times before. Disadvantaged young people are amongst those with the most to lose from the government's plans and this is evidenced by the Department for Education's own equality impact assessment that states those from sender backgrounds, Asian ethnic groups, disadvantaged backgrounds and males are disproportionately likely to be affected. BTECs are a route to university for many of these young people. And the Social Mar Market Foundation found that 44% of white working class students that enter university studied at least one BTEC and 37% of black students enter with only BTEC qualifications. The Nuffield Foundation found that a quarter of students now enter university with BTEC qualifications and are likelier to be from disadvantaged backgrounds. The vast majority of BTEC students complete their studies successfully with 60% graduating with at least a 2-1. I was contacted by a constituent ahead of this debate to share their experiences studying BTEX. And they said that dyslexia greatly affects their short-term memory, making exam-based qualifications which rely on memory recall, such as A-levels, almost completely out of reach for them yeah. and others with dyslexia. And instead, they said, they pursued a BTEC in mechanical engineering which allowed them to be assessed on coursework and practical applications across the span of two years. And if it was not for the BTEC qualification and the support they received through that process, they would not be able to pursue their BEng at university today. And in fact, another point they said, they just summed it up better than I could actually. 
BTECs are a vital lifeline to all neurodivergent and underprivileged children in the UK for whom A-levels may not be a viable option. Students with dyslexia, ADHD and ASD face larger barriers to mainstream forms of education than most and by cutting funding for BTECs it will ultimately deter these students from achieving their potential and integrating them into industry workforces. Can I take that introduction? Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful for making that point in the speech that she's making. Uh, and I think this government has had an obsession with exams over the course of the last mm. 12 years as the only way of demonstrating uh, what a student knows. Doesn't the fact that so many students who get a second chance through BTEX go on then to get are successful at university and get degrees yeah. prove that this focus on exams uh, and dismissing the achievements of those students who have qualifications largely based on coursework is entirely wrong-headed. My friend makes an excellent point there and I will move on to uh, talk about choices which has already been talked about and, and, and how people can progress and make different choices um, about their career and future, what they want to do. But um, it's exactly that. Narrowing those options uh, will make it much more difficult. So uh, following on from the point I raised about neurodivergent uh, students, I'll be very interesting to hear from the Minister about what assessment has been made about supporting neurodiverse, neurodivergent students who would be impacted by the, uh, these proposals to defund uh, BTECs. Um, the principal of Luton Sixth Form College, Altaf Hussein, uh, based in my honourable friend, the member for Luton North constituency, has made this point to me. By allowing that flexibility for the A-levels and forcing the T-level route for students with lower prior attainment, the government is creating a divided society that is penalising the most vulnerable in our society. The point is that many young people do not want to, or even should not have to, decide their future path at 16. Interests, aspirations and capabilities all change. I'll, I'll, I'll re-emphasise the point. It's not about one route over others. It's about empowering young people to be able to shape their own learning. T-levels could be a welcome development, but they should sit alongside rather than replace BTECs. I, I, I will give way. Kay Green. She's absolutely right about keeping options open for young people. To decide your whole future at the age of 16, frankly, would have been unrealistic for most of us, and it flies in the face of what most educational systems around Western Europe are doing. Does she not also agree with me that employers want young people with a rounded range of skills and qualifications, vocational, academic, practical, and that this obsession with people going down an academic or a vocational road is completely at odds with what happens in most workplaces? I thank my right honourable friend for, as ever, a very thoughtful contribution there, and I thoroughly agree with her. Um, T-levels won't fill the gap, and ministers know this, as it's not just about the qualification and specific workplace at the end, it's about tailoring learning and types of assessment to suit people's development. Um, I understand the government's justification for defunding some BTEC qualifications is that they overlap with one of the new T-level qualifications, or if the qualification is not re-approved as it does not meet new quality and necessity criteria. So concerns have been raised about the overlap process by the Protect the Student Choice campaign uh, for these reasons, that it's not transparent. Um, some unusual decisions have been made on qualifications. And so, for example, one awarding organisation's diploma in health and social care featured on the list, but the diplomas from other awarding organisations did not. Um, engineering BTECs were included despite most engineering T-levels featuring in waves three and four. So, um, some clarity there would be very welcome. Um, and fundamentally, there is no student provider or employer input in this overlap process. Uh, and also, the reapproval process um, is expected to make its first announcement in September. So, can I urge the Minister to ensure that the same failures uh, are not replicated in that process? Um, as all BTEC qualifications must go through this process, it must be transparent and decision-making not the preserve solely of Whitehall and external consultants. And as a bare minimum, the public, especially hard-working students, expect the government to be open and clear about its plans. And it severely damages trust in the government to do the right thing and the credibility of the policy. So the government must go further than simply delaying the defunding of BTEX by 12 months and making vague commitments to only remove a small proportion. It should rethink the plan and guarantee that funding will not be removed unless an impartial, evidence-based assessment has concluded that a qualification is not valued by students, universities or employers. 
Reckless policy making that could be disastrous for social mobility and the economy must not be made without, with, must not be made without hard supporting evidence. Thank yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Vera Hopehouse. So, Mark, and it's a pleasure to serve with you in the chair, and I also want to congratulate um, the Honourable Member for Battersea for leading us in this excellent debate. So, Mark, here is another broken promise from the Conservative government. For months, we Liberal Democrats have warned that the government was planning to scrap BTEX. Our concerns heightened during the passage of the post-16 education bill. We were given assurances after insurances, but here we are. And it is quite interesting to see that <laughs> as soon as some Conservative members are free of the shackles of government, they do actually stand up and support BTEX, and I wished there would be more. In July, the Department for Education... I, I, I will get... Well, I, Rebecca Powell. Said, obviously I'm speaking up for BTEX, but I'm also defending, I think the government's going in absolutely the right direction in terms of its skills and opportunities and this absolute recognition of aligning skills and opportunities with business needs. And I'm sure she would agree with that. I, I absolutely agree with that, but the government is going to scrap BTEX and she herself is opposing it. So that's the only point I was making. Um, in July, the Department for Education introduced a twin track system for A and T levels for young people at the age of 16, and the result is funding for most BTEC qualifications are going to go. 100 MPs, including myself and peers, wrote to the Department of Education in support of the Protect Student Choice campaign, a coalition of 21 organizations who represent students and staff in schools, colleges, and universities, uh, uh, and universities to save BTEX. And I want to thank the over 100,000 petitioners, many of them from Bath College and Bath Spa University, so that we will continue to resist the move to defund BTEX. <laughs> it is particularly the creative subjects which will suffer. The government is intending to scrap those BTEX which they deem to overlap with A and T levels, but the process of assessing what is an overlap is not at all transparent. Who were the six assessors commissioned by the DFE to review the 2,000 or so qualifications? What were their backgrounds of experience? Where is the written evidence of their conclusions to defund 160 qualifications? Ofqual have quality assured these qualifications for many years. Ofsted which oversees the quality of education, has at no point suggested that these qualifications lead to poor outcomes. So why do they go? BTECs are invaluable to provide very different types of educational experiences, and we have already heard a lot about this this afternoon. They are popular with students, res uh, respected by employers, and provide a well-established route to higher education. They work. So what other than a narrow-minded ideological view has led the government to scrap most of them and create less choice, especially for those learners who come from disadvantaged backgrounds? We Liberal Democrats acknowledge that from time to time the range of qualifications, qualifications need to be reviewed, but not by closing viable educational pathways, especially for those students from poorer or from minority backgrounds. Research from the Social Market Foundation found 44% of white working class students entered university with at least one BTEC, so do 37% of black students. BTEC, BTEC as an option risks that students, uh, removing BTEC as an option, risks that students fail courses or pick courses that they're not engaged with. Students today need more, not less support. They need more, not less choice. They need choices and a government which understands that providing diverse pathways to qualification will end up, we will all end up, with a much better, wider and diverse workforce. And I hope the government will think again. Thank you. Congratulating the 13,437 people who signed the petition, don't scrap funding for BTEC performing arts. And I'll come back onto that uh, in my speech. 
I'd also like to congratulate and place on record my thanks to the over 108,000 people who signed the Pro Protect Student Choice petition. And as other members have done during this debate, I would also like to place on record the excellent work that my local college, Lewisham College, do in uh, developing our young people and others to be able to go on and be successful in BTEX and continue further. Now, securing a Westminster Hall debate clearly shows the strength of feeling around the plans to defund BTEX. And I'm really glad to see people from all different political parties contributing to this and showing the strength of feeling on this. And I'm sure you're all aware that young people in England can currently choose between three types of level three qualifications at the age of 16. Ac academic qualifications such as A-levels, technical qualifications that lead to a specific occupation, and applied general qualifications such as BTECs that combine the development of practical skills with academic learning. And now this all changed in July 2021 when the Department for Education confirmed plans to replace this three-route model with a two-route model of A-levels and T-levels. Now, as a result, funding for the majority of BTEC qualifications will be removed. And it's disappointing that this was the government's decision that they reached, even after the rule for review, which said that BTECs are valuable in the labour market and a familiar and acknowledged route into higher education. Now, whilst the government insists this is not a cut, it absolutely is. Yeah. I'm grateful to her for giving way. She, she refers to the government's decision in July 2021, a year ago. As well as being a year ago, it's actually four education secretaries ago. Does she agree with me that we have these education secretaries who pop into the job for a few months without any knowledge previously of this uh, work, make massive decisions, and then disappear to go and do a different job, leaving those lifelong educationists to pick up the pieces for the appalling work that they've done? Um, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. He makes a really, really powerful and important point. These are people's lives. These are people's futures. These are people's opportunities to get on in life. And I say this um, because, you know, quite often these are lifelines. And I say a lifeline because I talk from experience. After failing my GCSEs as a working class 16 year old, having had a very difficult background, it was a BTEC in performing arts, performing arts, I'm doing a bit of performing, that got me back into education and ultimately to university. Actually made me excited about education again. A BTEC was my second chance. Kate Green. Um, would my honourable friend therefore not agree with me that the government's ambitions for a lifelong loan entitlement so that adults can return to learning and achieve level four and beyond qualifications is going to be compromised if it doesn't give people the widest possible range of opportunities to get the level three qualifications that will enable them to take advantage of that subsequent opportunity. Yeah, my <laughs> honourable friend makes a really good and important point about everybody having that access to the education at the points and times in life when they need it. So this government's decision to hastily remove BTEC funding quite simply makes a mockery of its claims to be levelling up in education. And this is made worse when you examine impact assessments of this decision, which highlights 27% of BTEC students are deemed the most disadvantaged. And I'm wholeheartedly opposed to these changes. Scrapping BTEC funding is just simply the wrong call. And whilst this is the case for several reasons, one of the main uh, things for me has to do with my life story. A young kid that many thought was never going to go on to achieve anything. I went to Accrington and Wellesdale College. I studied my BTEC in performing arts. This led me to believe that I could go on to university. This led me to believe that I could be stood here one day as an MP. You know, it is life changing opportunities for people. We're going to help us. It's really fascinating to hear her story. And will she agree from her own experience that it is so important that we provide education that engage young people 
who otherwise find academic subjects sometimes very difficult to engage with at first and then need a little bit of a sort of moving towards an educational route that actually engages and enthuses them. Um, I absolutely agree with the honourable member. You know, for me, studying uh, performing arts actually taught me that I loved history, taught me that I loved geography, taught me about team working, you know, so many other skills that are so important in life. Now, BTECs are engines of social mobility. Research from the Social Market Foundation found that 44% of white working class students that enter university studied at least one BTEC, and 37% of black students enter with only BTEC qualifications. And as already been said, but research from the Nuffield Foundation found that a quarter of students now enter university with BTEC qualifications, and they are th likelier to be from disadvantaged backgrounds. The vast majority of BTEC students complete their studies successfully, with 60% graduating with at least a 2-1. Got to confess, I only got a 2-2. Um, so, my question to the Minister is simple. Why do ministers want to take this second chance away from young people up and down the country and from other people when it's not evidence-based? Mm -hmm. So I'll end by once again stating how strongly I, I oppose the defunding of BTEX. We all know scrapping BTECs would be disastrous for social mobility and the economy. The government should rethink its plans to scrap these valuable qualifications and guarantee that funding will not be removed from any BTEC unless an impartial, evidence-based assessment has concluded that students, universities or employers do not value it, as we know they do at the moment. Sorry, Sorry. Anderson. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said Manira Wilson. I'm sorry. I misheard you. My apologies. I will sit down and I'll wait till the end. There we go. Thank you so much for calling me. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, Sir Mark. And I want to add thanks to my honourable friend and neighbour, the, member, the honourable member for Battersea, for sponsoring this hugely important debate, and for all of the 108,000 people who signed the petition, and thank the Protect Student Choice Coalition for their unprecedented campaign, um, bringing together teachers and learners and parents and businesses from across the country to ask the government to think again on this issue. And I welcome the new minister to her place. She has got on a plate here the opportunity to change the opportunities for thousands of young people across the country by looking again at this policy. And I hope that she is listening very carefully um, and will take the action as her homework over the summer, but very urgently as well, um, because once taken away, once defunded, these BTECs will be hard to put back into place. Much better to stop, rethink and not defund these BTECs. I will. And I'm very conscious that the, that the system of education we have in Northern Ireland is different from what it is here, so this debate is slightly different for us. But I want to ask this question. Does the Honourable Lady share my concerns that every time there's a major educational changes, there's always at least one to two years of children who pay the price of the changes on teaching by being delayed? And uh, the marking style answers as well. Children can't afford to be the losers. So does the Honourable Lady share uh, my concern is that the Minister and Government must make cognizance of making any change, changes or any decision to go a different direction. The Honourable Member of Stranford makes a very good point. These changes will be detrimental. This is what uh, teachers are telling all of us, they, these MPs who are here today and many, many others. Um, and that's what they're saying through this petition, but that's what they've told us. And that's why I've come here, because I've come here because those heads of my local institutions have told me of the detrimental damage this will do if it, if it goes ahead. And I speak together today on behalf of colleges and sixth forms in Wandsworth who are deeply concerned about the impact that this will have on our, especially on disadvantaged young people. So it's a it's a perverse outcome. It's exactly the opposite of what the introduction of T-levels is supposed to do. Um, and no one here is objecting to T-levels. What we're objecting to is that, that there's, it's taking away the three-track system. 
One college is South Thames College, which has already been mentioned by my honourable friend for Battersea, which with, with South Thames Group has 21,000 students across South London. And from poor, talking to them, they have a large number of students who are taking business BTEC who will not move to T-level because, first of all, they can't work part-time whilst doing the T-level because the T-level is full-time. There are many people who have to work part-time to make ends meet and for their family, um, and they will not be able to do that. And so their families will say, sorry, you cannot carry on in education. We need you to work. So they'll have to drop going, being able to go to South Thames. And I've met several of those students who are saying, I have been able to come here to do a B business BTEC. My siblings want to come here, but my family is saying you probably won't be able to if, uh, if it has to move to T-level, which is full-time. Secondly, because the college will find it very hard to find enough business placements in our area. As has been mentioned by other members, there is a high number of SMEs, small businesses in Wandsworth, who will not be able to take on um, these business placements, especially because so many businesses are struggling at the moment. Just this morning, I met with the head of the Wandsworth Chamber of Commerce, and she said it will be very hard for businesses to be able to support T-levels, but they really want to see more students doing business BTEC, more students doing business qualifications, but actually this will have the absolute op opposite effect, and it will be damaging to our local economy. The third reason why they will find it difficult to stay is because there are barriers to entry, higher level entry for the T-level. It's not that step it into post-16 um, education that T-levels is supposed to rep, uh, replace, but it, but it doesn't. BTEC do something that T-levels don't. And finally, for those who have to stay on and do their GCSE maths um, in English and catch up, they'll have to spend a year doing that and then start the T-level, which puts them at a year behind their peers. Their peers will be going ahead with their um, qualifications and they will, be, they will feel like they're behind and they just won't, it won't be attractive to take up a T-level having had to spend a whole year catching up with GCSEs. Whereas actually if you can do the same alongside each other, the BTEC alongside you're catching up with GCSEs, that's far more attractive and keeps young people in education. So South Thames College notes that the Department for Education's own impact assessment for its consultation acknowledges that students from more disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to be taking the qualifications that it's planning to remove and that it will need mitigation action to avoid causing them detriment. St Cecilia's School in Southfields share exactly the same concerns as South Thames College. They offer BTECs in business, travel and tourism, music tech and applied science. Um, I have met with previous ministers and I have introduced South Thames College teachers to previous ministers so that they could talk about their concerns. And I would invite the minister to meet with those teachers, to talk to those people who, are, who know the effect this is going to have. At St Celia's BTEC business attracts more pupils than any other about 25 a year. It's a popular subject at GCSE, and many want to then progress from the level two course to the level three course. It's about 25% of all their BTEC students. It's the most valued and popular BTEC. And they can't just switch from BTEC business to T-level business. These cuts would mean a significant number of pupils in year 11 would not be able to progress to the sixth form. And very concerningly, I'm hearing of schools saying that they will not be able to offer anything except A-levels if we move to this system, which is, exact, which is not what ministers want to be the outcome of introducing T-levels. Uh, but it will be if there's no stop, reset, rethink. Most sixth forms the size of St Celia's will struggle to offer T-levels. They lack the space, the resource, the ability to merge it into a timetable where other BTECs and A-levels were offered. And for St Celia's, they also say that they will not have the staff capacity to organise all of the business placements that are needed because that's um, going to be a barrier as well. They'll be competing with other sixth forms and colleges in an already packed market in Wandsworth. So if that's true of South London, how much more will it be true of around the country? How much more will rural areas be affected? I just don't see how this, um, how this new T-level with its business um, needs can be met the head of St Celia says, many pupils in year 11 at St Celia's opt to take a blend of courses of BTEC alongside A-levels and not being able to offer business would reduce the rich diversity in our current sixth form as well. 
If schools cannot offer T-levels for the reasons that I've stated, they may switch to A-level business, but that will be a barrier to entry for pupils who prefer, need to study in a different way for many reasons. The school's leadership believes that to defund BTEX would go against the government's own clear principle of placing curriculum development at the heart of school improvement. And it's really not trusting our student leaders, our heads of education, our teachers to make the best decisions, and it goes back to pupil choice as well. School leaders should be given the freedom to decide which courses are best suited to their cohorts. They know them very well. This means a choice between BTEX, T-levels, A-levels and apprenticeships. When the Minister comes to respond, I would like to know what the Department is doing to address the concerns of institutions such as South Thames College and St Cecilia's, and if she would come and meet with those institutions. In particular, I want to know what mitigations are being pro pro proposed to help disadvantaged young people who will be affected by this. Has there been an evidence-based assessment? We're, we're all calling that from that cross-party today. Please look at the evidence base for making this huge decision. Will she commit to permitting a wider range of part-time work options to count as an industry placement? Would she relax restrictions on the number of placements that can make up the industry placement total? All important questions, but the most important is this. Will she, or her replacement, look again at this ill-thought-out and reckless policy? I implore her to rethink and not to defund, defund BTEX. Colleges oppose it, sixth forms oppose it, students oppose it, and the losers will be the most disadvantaged. In one fell swoop, and to conclude, Mr Chair, this will disproportionately cut educational opportunities for black and Asian students, for students from financially disadvantaged backgrounds, for students with learning disabilities and with mental health challenges. It's not too late to look again at this policy and stop it. And by doing this, you will improve the educational opportunities of young people across the country. Thank you very much. Nav Mishra. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sir Mark. It's a, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, particularly as, a, as you're a Northwestern uh, MP like myself. I also want to congratulate my, my good friend, uh, the Honourable Member for Battersea. She's brought a very important uh, issue um, to this chamber, and, and I hope uh, the Minister will give us a uh, reasonable, reasonable uh, response. Um, before, I, before I go into my speech, I want to place on record my gratitude uh, to all teaching staff and support staff uh, in Stockport, in my constituency, but across the country, across the world, because the last two years, two and a half years, have been very challenging for all of us. But teaching staff, support staff, people who work in the, in the catering teams, all, all, all of those people have gone uh, way above and beyond. And uh, I'm, 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 I think everyone in this, in this room will agree. We're very grateful to them for their, for their significant uh, contri contribution. I have received... Um, correspondence from local colleges in my constituency, uh, Aquinas College and Stockport College, and uh, I believe that my constituency was in the league table, the top 10 constituencies where the petition uh, was signed. I think 639 people in my constituency signed this, and nationally 108,329 people signed this petition. So uh, these numbers are quite serious, and I hope... Um, the number of people, I, I often attend debates in Westminster Hall where it's just two people or, or three people, and there are several MPs here from, from all, 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 well, pretty much all, all, all political parties. So I, 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 I hope that reflects the importance of this, of this uh, subject. Um, Aquinas College, in my constituency, educates over 2,200 young people every year, and, and Danny Pearson, the principal, he has written to me on this, on this matter. Stockport College is part of the Trafford College Group and educates over 5,500 young people across several boroughs. And uh, I know my good friend from Stratford and Elmston, she's made, a, made an intervention earlier, and her and I work closely with Trafford College Group to make sure that these young people, and, and some, some older people like myself, get, get the opportunities that, uh, that they need, that our economy needs, that Greater Manchester Greater Manchester needs, and James Scott, who's the principal at Trafford College Group, he's written to me, and I found his uh, contribution to be uh, quite serious. Mm -hmm. That's that one of the reasons why, why I, I'm here. Both of them, Mr. Pearson and Mr. Scott, both of them have uh, expressed serious concerns over, over the plans by the government to remove funding 
for these qualifications. Um, uh, lots of people from the constituency, lots of residents in my constituency have also contacted me in the last few days regarding this, this, this debate, so it's, it's quite a serious issue. And I just wanted to, to talk about levelling up. The government talks a lot about levelling up, but actually, you know, actions speak louder than words. And when, when we talk about levelling up, we need to invest in our young people, we need to invest in our education system, we need to make sure that people are given the opportunity for education, for further employment, for skilled employment. We don't want the race to the bottom, we don't want zero-hour contracts, we want skilled, well-paid jobs that people can rely on, they can have dignity and they can survive in this brutal cost of living crisis that, that, we're, going, that we're going through. Um, BTEX, uh, several members have made these comments, so I, I don't wish to repeat them at length, but BTEX have made a significant contribution to the local economy and social mobility um, in, 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 in the UK. Defunding them will leave many young people without a viable pathway in, um, in turn having an impact on the progress to skilled employment or higher education. Um, several members have made the point about the disproportionate impact that disadvantaged young people, will, you know, that these cuts will have on disadvantaged young people. The, the point is covered in the Department for Education's own equalities impact, impact assessment, and the government should not ignore this, although um, I'm not hopeful that the government won't ignore uh, its own equalities impact assessment. I'd, I'd welcome some comments from the Minister uh, on this particular point later on. And I'm a proud Labour MP, I'm a proud trade unionist. Um, it's, it's, I also wanted on the record that National Education Union, University College Union, UCU, Unison and NASUWT, they're all supporting this campaign. Um, and I referred earlier, several members referred, almost 110,000 people signed the petition. So it's quite a, quite a serious, serious campaign. Uh, I could repeat the points that have been made by, made by colleagues earlier on. I'm not, I'm not going to do that, mm -hmm. although uh, I, I'm aware that this can go up to three hours, this debate. But, uh, so, Mark, don't, don't worry. I know you look concerned. I won't, I won't repeat those points again. So I wanted to finish on the point that um, uh, social, mobility and, uh, social mobility is very important. We, we need the investment. That, that these, these cuts are, uh, haven't been thought out properly, and they will have an impact uh, serious impact in Greater Manchester in the Northwest, and we need we need the investment. I hope um, I hope the minister takes on the comments, and uh, her responses will be will be, be useful to, to to our residents. I thank you for for calling. Mark, yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And just before I bring in the front bench uh, spokespeople, could I just say to the honourable member, I've taught for four years at the college in his constituency, so. I Stockport, concur Stockport with a good, good amount of what I said. Um, Munira Wilson. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Sir Mark. And please forgive me again for mishearing earlier. And uh, apologies to the Honourable Member for Putney, who made an excellent speech, probably far better than what I'm about to say. Um, so um, can I thank the Petitions Committee as well for bringing forward this debate and for the Honourable Member for Battersea uh, for opening it so ably. Now, vocational and technical qualifications and training have, in my view, for too long been incorrectly treated as inferior to academic qualifications uh, with an ingrained cultural bias right across our society. Um, and I include myself in that, and I, I hope my own mindset is shifting now, um, with a bias in favour of academic achievement. Yet these vocational skills are more important than ever as our country faces immense skill shortages across so many different sectors. So whilst the government's um, newfound focus on vocational and te technical training is very, very welcome, we here on these Liberal Democrat benches are opposed to the defunding of the majority of BTECs, or essentially scrapping most of them. Um, as many have said, the move will hurt the most disadvantaged students. It, will, it narrows choice instead of widening opportunities for all. And, it, and we're kick-starting here a damaging defunding process from 2024 before the T-level concept has even been properly proven and the qualif new qualifications bedded in. BTEC are immensely popular, with over a quarter of a million students taking BTEC qualifications in any given year. They're disproportionately taken up by students from poorer backgrounds, ethnic minorities, those with special educational needs and disabilities, as the DfE's own impact assessment has confirmed. Now, uh, the Honourable Member for Luton South and my Honourable Friend, the Member for Bath, have already cited the statistics. 
of the large percentage of white working class and black students who make it to university having taken BTEX, uh, and the, 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 the large percentage who would go on to achieve a 2-1 or higher at university. So perhaps instead I can cite a former conservative education secretary in the House of Lords, Lord Baker, who during the passage of the skills bill uh, in that place described the plan to defund BTEX as, quote, absolutely disgusting because it would deny black, Asian, ethnic minority, disadvantaged and disabled students hope and aspiration. His words, not mine. So, um, moving on to the point about choice, uh, which is where the Honourable Member for Battersea started her argument, and I think that's the crux of it here, and there's very wide cross-party, I think, agreement on this po point. Whilst there's always some value in rationalising qualifications from time to time, forcing students to make that choice between A-levels and T-levels will, will narrow, them just at the, narrow those choices just at the time when we need them to have a range of ways to gain the transferable skills needed for their future careers. And while some BTECs will remain, those that are equivalent to a single A-level or a small number equivalent to two A-levels, the majority will disappear. And I wanted to give an example from Isha College. It's not in my constituency, but it serves a number of my constituents. And students can study BTEC, such as applied science, business, or digital film and video produ production in combination with complementary A-levels, such as chemistry, computer science, or graphic communication. However, BTEC also allows students to choose an unrelated A-level, enabling them to follow a passion. As uh, I mean, the, the Honourable Member for Lewisham Deptford, I, 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 her speech was just brilliant and so inspiring and powerful because it was based on her personal story. But she talked about the passion that brought her back to education. And, and that's what a lot of students are choosing to do, to mix and match so that they can round out their, exper their, their expertise and their experiences in foreign languages, maths or politics. Uh, you know, subjects that benefit the economy and our young people. Uh, and at a time when employers are crying out for our young people to enter the workforce which, with far, far broader skills and experience, Surely we should be broadening the choice and allowing that mix and match approach rather than the government trying to force everyone into these two straitjackets. Now, um, uh, scrapping BTEX will leave many students w without a viable pathway at the age of 16. Um, and for some who begin A-levels but don't enjoy them and struggle to cope, BTEX offer a vocational lifeline to supplement their academic co qualifications. One constituent of mine, Lucas, started out studying three A-levels, but switched to a BTEC in music in his first year at sixth form. He went from contemplating leaving without any qualifications whatsoever to achieving the highest grade in the county in his BTEC. He's now working as a teaching assistant supporting um, children with special educational needs and disabilities. And he's concerned about what scrapping BTECs uh, and removing choice will mean for his pupils in the future. Now, in response to this um, petition, which was signed by 331 of my constituents from Twickenham, the government argued that reform is necessary. And, and as I've already said, uh, I and my party fully agree that we must do much more to achieve parity between vocational and academic qualifications. But scrapping BTEX is not the answer. Um, they've got, uh, recently undergone a rigorous process of reform. They're popular with students, respected by employers, and provide a well-established route to higher education or employment. Now, the government's answer in terms of um, T levels are, are welcome, um, but and you know they, the technif technical qualifications, giving 16 to 19 year olds a mixture of classroom and on-the-job experience, including uh, a work placement, are really welcome. But there are a number of problems, and, and a number of uh, honourable members have have touched on these, and I just wanted to, to go into these in a little bit more detail. Um, the association of colleges is concerned that the transition is being rushed and I wholeheartedly agree with them um, that uh, if there is to be this transition uh, that this it should take place over 10 years ensuring that no qualifications are defunded without a full alternative in place and on that point I was talking to the principal of Richmond upon Thames College in my constituency uh, just this morning um, and about one in ten of his current uh, students is studying a course that is due to be defunded. And because they are not, for a variety of reasons, on um, a part of the waves to introduce T-levels, there is no alternative. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, those future students would have no alternative if, uh, if those uh, courses are indeed defunded from 2024 onwards. So, um, you know, I would say that the, before T-levels are fully bedded in and understood, that starting to defund uh, BTEX so soon is, is premature. And indeed, another Conservative Education Minister, Lord Willits, said in, during the passage of the Skills Bill that T-levels should succeed on their merits, not because viable alternatives are removed by government. Um, and I think that chimes with a lot of what we've heard here today. But that is a Conservative former Education Minister saying that. Um, now, ministers claim that students are confused by the current range of qualifications, but there's little evidence to support that. There are 39 subjects available across the entire sixth form college sector, with only nine available at Isha College, which I've uh, mentioned earlier, for example. Now, ministers may be confused by that choice, but students certainly aren't. Um, and uh, every year, about a third of Isha's cohort studies at least one BTEC. Um, and the flexibility for students to be able to pull together their own study programme is, is really essential as they try and work out what the right choices are for them for the future. Um, the T levels that are being introduced are 25% practical and 75% academic, which, as some people have already alluded to, does put them out of reach for many students um, who may achieve lower grades in their GCSEs. Um, and they are, these are often the people who really flourish on the BTEC pathway. Um, and the Association of Colleges has warned that T-levels will exclude those students who are the most disadvantaged, particularly those who don't uh, obtain a, a level four in maths and English GCSE. T-levels are rigorous and large qualifications. So although the government doesn't require maths and English T-level uh, for T-level uh, entry, many colleges are actually requiring this. Um, and as a number of honourable members have alluded to, there is a real challenge with the industry placement that comes uh, with T-levels. Trying to achieve that 45 days is really incredibly difficult. Um, I think it was a policy exchange, a conservative think tank, which says only 8% of uh, employers are currently offering placement uh, for the duration required uh, for T-levels. And some sectors are harder to find placements for than others. For instance, the digital industries uh, often got teams working remotely. Um, and we know that there is also a challenge between rural uh, and suburban and urban areas. And indeed, again, the principal of Richmond upon Thames College said to me this morning how difficult it is for him to get employers to engage with and provide work placements for voca voca vocational qualifications. Now, that's in Greater London. Right, we're based in Twickenham, in Greater London, where there's a huge plethora of employers on the doorstep. Um, and he is actually leaving, sadly, uh, Richmond upon Thames College uh, later this year to go and head up Petrock, which is a multi-centre um, uh, college down in Devon. I happen to visit Petrock with a new honourable member for Tiverton and Honiton during the by-election. Uh, and one of the challenges that faces the principal of Richmond College as he goes to Petrock is that in a rural area, as I think the Honourable Member for Taunton Dean already made this point. It is even harder to find all those employers to engage with the, with the, with the T levels. So he's really got his work cut out, and I wish him all the best. So um, the final point I wanted to make about T levels is we really need to see where those completing T, T levels courses go to next. The Association of School and College Leaders has said. We're watching the number of T-level students who end up in university with real interest. If T-level students are going to end up in university in large numbers and not in further technical training, then it bring, brings into question why BTECs are being defunded. After all, that's the government's main argument for scrapping BTECs in order to introduce A-levels. So, uh, you know, it, it can't have... The, they went on to say the government can't have it both ways, and I completely agree with that point. And uh, a final point about... Um, defunding, before I conclude, um, Sir Mark, is around process. There's been a real lack of transparency about which BTECs are being chosen first to be defunded. Um, and when, uh, when questions have been asked around um, improving transparency, there has been very little forthcoming. And I, I see this as part of a, a wider trend. We were talking about BTECs today, but in terms of wider ap applied general qualifications, I happen to have RSL awards based in my constituency, and that's an awarding body for 
um, contemporary music and arts qualifications. They do the rock school uh, qualification grading. Um, and they, some of their qualifications got delisted um, for reasons they failed to understand. They tried to appeal. Um, they've been unsuccessful in their appeal. They've been told case closed. And when I met with them, they told me, uh, as with the BTEC point, that with their, some of their music qualifications, uh, more than a quarter of their students are from black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds in a way that of, often with classical music qualifications, you just don't get that diversity. Uh, and it tends to be much more white, much more middle class. And having that breadth of qualifications means that young people from a whole range of backgrounds are able to engage um, and, and, and secure qualifications. So I urge the minister, if they're going to continue down this route, can we at least have a bit more transparency about what is being defined funded when. So um, to conclude, I think we've heard very clearly from all sides of the chamber that it's very difficult to understand why the government is wanting to scrap this, what is a very popular qualification with uh, both students and employers, um, and, and trying to, to, to shoehorn them into to one or other uh, route of T-levels or A-levels, at a time when young people need more support than ever to, uh, to realise and rebuild their futures. This is such a retrograde step and will damage the prospects of the most disadvantaged students. If this government is serious about levelling up, which it tells us it is, uh, although I don't think we've heard much about it from any of the Conservative leadership candidates yet, mm -hmm. um, and if they're really, truly about, uh, mean it when they say they want to champion vocational training, I hope the, uh, the new minister, who I welcome to her place, will listen to the thousands of people who signed this petition, to the college leaders and teachers and uh, experts in this field up and down the country, as well as many of its own former education ministers and secretaries, some of whom I've quoted today. It really must think again. Thank you. Nicole Toby Perkins. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Sir Mark. It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I'd like to start by thanking all those who've uh, pushed for today's debate, uh, and particularly to the Sixth Form College Association and the AOC, who've been particularly vocal in standing up against the anti-BTEC orthodoxy that threatened to take hold in ministerial offices uh, at the Department for Education. I think it's been uh, a really excellent debate with valuable contributions on all sides. I'd like to reflect on a few of them before I, I get into uh, my remarks. My honourable uh, friend from Battersea, who really presented this uh, whole debate excellently and uh, I think set up uh, the debate uh, that followed it. Uh, and she reflected that a quarter of uh, students who end up going to university uh, had done so through a BTEC, which I think was an incredibly important statistic uh, when you're thinking, uh, as she reflected, um, on the fact, as many other honourable members did, on that Social Market Foundation uh, research showing that 44% of white working class uh, students who attended university studied uh, a BTEC. And that was a point um, that was re repeated also by the honourable members from Bath, uh, from Lewisham Deptford, from Birkenhead uh, and from Twickenham. Uh, and I think that that was one of the really uh, major themes that came uh, through this whole debate. My honourable friend from Hull West uh, and Hessel reflected on the fact that her own daughter uh, had done a BTEC. My son also uh, went through the BTEC route and ended up uh, going to university. I think it's safe to say that without BTECs, he wouldn't have got that university uh, education. The honourable lady from Lewisham Deptford um, spoke passionately and movingly, I think, uh, about the difference that a BTEC made to her life and to her life chances. The Honourable Member from Worley spoke about the importance these qualifications uh, make alongside T-levels uh, to employers in the West Midlands. The Honourable Lady from Taunton Dean uh, spoke about the shortage of nurses in her community, the importance that BTEC played in addressing that shortage and the need for them to, to stay locally. She also controversially uh, spoke about the value of evidence-based assessment. I have <laughs> to warn her, she needs to stop that kind of talk if she wants to get back into this government. But it was a, a point that I think a lot of us uh, really uh, appreciated and, and was very uh, well made. The Honourable Lady from Mion Valley uh, spoke about the equalities impact uh, assessment uh, and made the in incredibly important point that there are so many students that if these qualifications disappear, simply won't have the route uh, that are currently available to them. My honourable friend from Luton South 
South. Luton yeah. South um, spoke about uh, neurodivergent students, and it's so important that their needs is reflected. There's not a single one of us that won't regularly get uh, contacts at our constituency surgeries from parents uh, of neurodivergent students who are absolutely at their wit's end. And having students like that, that have actually been able to access life opportunities that others are able to take for granted, say that these courses really help me, really matter to me, is something that we should uh, take incredibly seriously. Um, the, my honourable friend uh, from Stratford and Urmston, who uh, I know is incredibly passionate about uh, vocational students from her time uh, as the Shadow Education Secretary, uh, said that the government should end their obsession with suggesting that all students are either academic or vocational and recognise there are students uh, who want to, uh, to have a, a, an approach that enables them uh, to have that breadth of choice. Um, the honourable, uh, my honourable friend from Lewisham Deptford paid tribute to her local college uh, and said that this decision made a mockery of levelling up and I think that's a really important point. It was in incredibly um, obvious to those who watched the uh, Conservative Party uh, leadership hustings last night that levelling up seemed to entirely have disappeared from the lexicon uh, of new potential Conservative leaders. Um, and so it may well be the mockery that she speaks to is one that they've entirely decided to distance themselves from. But I know, but I think her, her contribution was one that many of us appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, my honourable friend from Putney uh, said that once lost, these qualifications can't be uh, easily replaced. And she uh, reflected the fact that many local institutions had contacted her with their concern about the approach the government was taking. And of course that shouldn't surprise us because when the government did their own consultation back in September, they found that 86% of respondents to their consultation disagreed with the approach that they were proposing. My honourable friend from Stockport said that his constituency was one of the top 10 constituencies in the country in terms of signing the petition. I know that all of us have been getting large numbers of uh, uh, of constituents contacting us, but it sounds like many of us have a lot to do if we can catch up with, with Stockport in terms of the level of uh, interest in this issue. An humble lady from Twickenham reflected upon the comments of Lord Baker in another place, describing it as absolutely uh, disgusting. He also um, described this uh, move as an act of educational vandalism, and I think that is something that should be reflected upon. Um, it, it is important, I think, to recognise that the broad coalition spearheaded by the Protection, Protect Student Choice campaign, backed up by organisations like the Sixth Form Colleges Association, Youth, Un Youth Employment UK, Million Plus, the Apprentice Network, and an array of employers and trade unions, has actually forced the government to change their position. It is, uh, it, it is important, I think, that we all make the point that government could, um, could re-look at what they've done. But it is also important to recognise there has been a significant U-turn from where the government were uh, back in September uh, of last year. Uh, and I'm pleased, and the Labour Party is pleased, to have played our part in that campaign, urging ministers to rethink their decision uh, to axe uh, these courses. And I think it's worthwhile recalling, Sir Mark, the history of the government's shambolic and damaging approach to this question. It started with ministers besmirching the reputation of BTEX. The skills minister at the time, the Honourable Member for Chichester, who's the one before the one before the Honourable Lady from Morley and out, well, it was 10 months ago, uh, of course, <laughs> described them as poor quality qualifications when announcing they were to be scrapped to make way uh, for T levels. Then in September, the Honourable Member for Stratford, who was the education, brand new education secretary at the time, he was the one before the one before this week's one, the fourth <laughs> one that we've had uh, in the space of a year. I, it has to be said, Sir Mark, mm -hmm. that they say that a year in the life of a human being is like seven years in the life of an education secretary. Uh, and that's what it appears to be. We're getting this dazzling array uh, of, uh, of new education secretaries. I can only imagine how busy the man responsible man or woman, responsible for the board at the Department for Education, constantly changing the name on that picture uh, up in the reception there, showing the, uh, the Education Secretary. But the, returning to, to the point, the Right Honourable Member uh, for Stratford um, told us that the government would now do a review. Now, many of us 
uh, believes that the government ought to have done the review before it sent out the message uh, to students and to lecturers that the qualification they were working towards was poor quality. Um, and then the government announced that they would be defunding 150 level 3 qualifications, which in truth is less than 10% of all of the level 3 qualifications out there. So firstly, we are pleased that the government have performed something of a U-turn on this issue. But in the final analysis, if they, co if they continue with their uh, current uh, position, not only will they have scrapped less than 10% of all the level 3 qualifications currently on offer, but they will also, uh, within that, be scrapping a number of courses that um, both employers uh, and uh, educationists uh, have real concern about. For example, the Health and Social Care BTEC, which offers students a strong general introduction to the career opportunities available in the healthcare uh, sector and had over 13,000 new students enrolled on health and social care BTECs last year. Um, and I think that it is important to reflect that in terms of these qualifications, if they are uh, scrapped, as the government currently uh, suggest they will be. Uh, there will be uh, huge numbers of students who will not have the breadth of options available. I think there's a number of important questions for the Minister to respond to. Many colleges are deeply concerned that the amount of work experience required to replace even the num limited number of BTECs being replaced here will not be able to be found. Now, the government have already downgraded the work experience requirement um, in the early years of the T-level qualification. So if it becomes apparent that the, in many areas providers are unable to find the amount of work experience required to deliver the number of T-levels, then the government is, is going to have a choice. Will the government reduce the work experience demand further? Will they allow BTECs which don't have the work experience element to continue? Or will they accept that many students will be shut out of accessing a career for which there, for which there is widespread skill shortages? Which one is it? Secondly, if it's the government's view that T-levels are more rigorous than BTECs and it's scrapping BTECs, what is the plan for those students who would previously have been able to study a BTEC and will now not have a Level 3 qualification at the age of 16 uh, to 17? And what assessment have government made of which students are likely to miss out, as has been reflected by so many contributors to this de debate? Isn't the truth that it will mean more students from deprived communities, more white working class boys and girls, more BAME students, uh, and more students from rural and small town communities that are likely to have no level three qualification in place. And if so, what are the plans in place for those students? Fourthly, early feedback is that T-levels require considerably more study and more work time. Many students, particularly those from deprived communities, are expected by their families to work alongside their studies. T-levels make that much more difficult, and it's being cited as a barrier to poorer students accessing them. What assessment has the Minister made of how this barrier could be addressed? And does it strengthen, in her view, the case for some sort of student subsidy along the lines of educational maintenance allowance for T-level students to enable them to afford to take up this opportunity? Does the Minister accept that it was a huge mistake for the Government to denigrate a qualification that students were in the process of studying before they completed their review? And given that so few courses are now being slated to be replaced, will she apologise on behalf of the Government to those students, to their lecturers and to the employers whose achievements the Government has belittled? And finally, I've met many students studying T-levels. It varies from course to course, but many of them clearly see it as a route to university. T-levels were initially envisaged as a route towards work. Does the government now accept that for many students, that won't be the path that they pursue? And on that basis, is it still sensible that T-levels should be so narrowly focused on a single discipline? And shouldn't the government recognise that a broader qualification allows students to learn which is the correct path for them from a position of knowledge. Now, the Labour Party welcomed the introduction of T-Labs. We want them to be a success, uh, and we hope that it will be uh, for a future Labour government to address uh, the current flaws within them. But I urge the government, at this, even at this late stage, to think again about this decision. We know in September they're going to come back. There are a number of courses that are very popular that educationalists and uh, students are telling us uh, will be deeply damaging if they are abolished. 
So we want to ensure that our system of post-16 vocational and technical education is fit for purpose. Every MP in this debate, alongside the organisations championing the Protect Student Choice campaign, wants this too. So let the government pause, put this decision on hold, make sure that it, we have an evidence-based approach to this replacement, and let's not lose qualifications that are of re real value to both employers and students. Uh, can I declare an interest? Um, I left school at 16 and um, eventually got to higher education through vocational qualifications. I have the privilege of sitting here today because of that. Um, the Minister has been extremely patient, listened for nearly two hours to the contributions. Uh, I'm quite sympathetic to the position that she's in, but I'm sure she'll handle it well. Need my glasses now, I'm at that age. <laughs> Um, thank you, um, Chairman Sam Mark, and it's an honour to serve under your chairmanship. Firstly, I want to thank the Honourable Member for Battersea for opening this debate and for ev every member across the House who's taken part in this important debate. Now, I see there's been a number of important questions that are raised today, and I hope to cover many of these in my speech, so do bear with me. I've got tons of notes here. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to discuss my department's um, plans for the reform of Level 3 qualifications including how BTECs will fit into the future landscape alongside A-levels and T-levels. The introduction of T-levels is critical to driving up productivity and supporting social mobility. Based on the same standards as apprenticeships, T-levels have been co-designed with employers and draw on the very best examples of international practice. They will raise the quality and prestige of the technical offer in this country, ensuring that young people develop knowledge and skills that hold genuine labour market currency. It is this model that makes T-levels special and the reason why we want them to be the qualifications of choice for 16 to 19-year-olds alongside A-levels. We have put in place significant investment in T-levels as well as support for the sector to help providers and employers prepare for them. Now, we are confident of the, their success and we will continue to carefully assess the progress of our reforms to ensure that no student or employer is left without access to the technical technical qualifications that they need. There are now 10 T-levels available in over 100 providers across the country. Now, by 2023, all T-levels will be available and around 400 providers have signed up to deliver them. We are introducing T-levels gradually to ensure quality from the start. Our confidence in their success is reinforced by the significant levels of investment and support we have in place. We have made 400 million capital funding available to support delivery since 2020, ensuring young people can learn in the world-class facilities and with industry standard equipment. We have also put in place substantial support for schools, colleges and employers to help them deliver high quality industry placements. And I will cover this in the questions because I know that a few people was concerned about the placements for all T levels on a national scale, including investing over 200 million since 2018 and 2019 to support providers in building capacity and networks with employers through the Capacity and Delivery Fund. Now, we want T levels to deliver great outcomes for learners. I'm sure everybody in this room wants that. We want great outcomes for learners. And so we are committed to ensuring that teachers and leaders have the support that they need to, to deliver them well. Now, in the past two years to March 2020, we invested up to 20 million to help providers prepare for the delivery of T-levels and to help teachers and leaders prepare for change. This included 8 million for new T-level professional development offer led by the Education and Training Foundation, we invested a further 15 million in 2020-21 and we've committed to over 15 million in 21 and 22 to continue this offer. Since its launch in 2019, almost 8,500 individuals in FE providers have benefited from T-level professional development programmes to help update their knowledge and skills. For first teaching T-levels in September 2020 and beyond. Now we'll continue to publish regu regular updates and evidence as part of our annual T-level action plans, which can be found on the government website. Now I met on Thursday with Leeds City College um, students. It was my first visit, um, and I met both students and also um, tutors. And there was great enthusiasm for T-levels and also our apprenticeship programme. And 
it, it was actually wonderful to see that uh, the majority of students I spoke to have already secured permanent employment in the, in the sector that they studied, which I think is a, an important move forward. Now, we read about students securing permanent job roles at the companies that they did their T-level placement in and other students securing an apprenticeship. Employees congratulated existing students and look forward to the next generation of T-levels students starting their placement. But these essential reforms will only have their full benefit if we simultaneously address the complexities and variable quality of the broader qualification system. Therefore, to support the introduction of T-levels, we are reviewing the qualification that sits alongside A-levels and T-levels to make sure that every funded qualification has a clear purpose, is high quality, and will lead to good outcomes for those who study. Now, successive reviews, including the Wolf and Sainsbury Review, which I know has been touched on today, have found that the current qualification system is overly complex and does not serve students or employers well. Through our reforms, we want every student to have confidence that every qualification on offer is high quality and to be able to easily understand what skills and knowledge that qualification will provide. Now, importantly, where will that qualification take them? Our reforms have been made in three stages. Firstly, the removal of funding approval for qualifications with low or no enrolments. The removal of funding approval for qualifications that overlap with T-levels. And finally, reform of the remaining qualifications. I do go in further detail in a moment. As part of the securing early progress in the review, we confirmed we would remove funding approval from qualifications that have had fewer than 100 publicly funded enrolments in a three-year period. Through this low and no process, we have confirmed that around 5,500 qualifications at level three are below and have low or no enrolments and therefore have funding removed by August 2022. The next phase of our reforms is to remove funding approval for qualifications that overlap with T-levels for 16 to 19 year olds, which will reduce the complexities for learners and employers. Now by overlap, we mean that qualification is technical and the outcome for the young person achieves are similar to those set out in a standard cover by a T-level and it aims to take a student to employment in the same occupational area. Now, just as T-levels have been introduced in phases, we are also taking a phased approach to removing funding approval from technical qualifications that overlap with T-levels. Now, this provision lists qualifications overlapping with WAVES 1 and 2 T-levels and included only 160 qualifications out of over 2,000 qualifications available at that time. We will publish a final list of qualifications that will have public funding withdrawn in September this year, September 2022. We have listened to carefully to concerns about the reform timetable and we've built in extra, an extra year so that public funding approval is not withdrawn from overlapping qualifications. Qualifications until August 2024 to help ensure providers are ready. Now, this means that qualifications that overlap with T-levels will not have funding approval removed until the relevant T-level has been available to all providers for at least a year. It is important that there are no gaps in provision and that we retain the qualifications we need to support progression into occupations that are not covered by T-levels. Now, our final reform, our policy statement on Level 3 qualifications, was published in July last year. And they set out the government's decision on the types of academic and technical qualifications that will be, necessarily, sorry, will, will be necessary along A-levels and T-levels at level three. Just bear with me while I have a sip of water. Now, on the academic side, we are absolutely clear that students will be able to take applied general style qualifications, including BTECs, alongside A-levels as part of a mixed programme where they will meet our new quality and necessity criteria. Now, this could include areas with a practical or occupational focus, such as health and social care, which I know has got mentioned, or STEM subjects such as engineering and applied science and also IT. We will also fund large academic qualifications that would typically make up a student's full programme of study areas where there are no A-levels and there is no equivalent T-level. Now, this point got mentioned. Um, it can also in include areas that are less served by A-levels, such as performing arts and creative arts or sports, science, where they give access to HE courses 
with high levels of practical content. Now, as the Honourable Lady for Lewisham, Deptford, um, I, I ask, are we the same person? Because we have a similar background. You know, I too, um, from a, a working class girl who studied a BTEC national, though mine was in business and finance. And I also got a background in performing arts. So I think it's evident that um, the party opposite isn't the only party who is a broad church, but the party of government is also. Now, I then went on as a mature student to study economics at the Open Uni and international relations at the University of Lincoln whilst I was a parliamentary candidate. So I know what it's like juggling and trying to pay your way at the same time. Oh, I certainly will. Yeah. How do you break this, Minister? I listened to her really carefully as she described the new landscape and how she sees it fitting together. But she said a few moments ago that there was confusion about the range of qualifications that had been on offer. I have to say, listening to her just now, I'm still pretty confused uh, about the landscape that we are moving into. What is the government planning to do to communicate really clearly to students, to institutions and to employers about how this new landscape will work? Thank you, Your Honourable Lady, for a question. Um, if you bear with me when I come to the question point, because it's sort of been touched on earlier and I can answer that regarding the pathways. Now, on a t more technical route, we will fund two groups of technical qualifications alongside T levels for aged 16 to 19 year olds. The first will be qualifications in areas where there isn't a T level. The second will be specialist qualifications that develop more specialist skills and knowledge that could be acquired through a T level alone helping to protect the skill supply in more specialist industries and adding value to the T-level offer. Adults will be able to study a broader range of technical qualifications than 16 to 19-year-olds, which, which... Sorry, does somebody want to give up? No? Okay. <laughs> Um, which takes into account prior learning and, and experience. Now, this includes technical qualifications that allow entry into occupations that are already served by T-levels. Now, I hope this... I hope that this has made clear that we are not creating a binary system. Our aim is to ensure that students can choose from a variety of high-quality options, which I'll go into. This is why it's important that we reform the system to ensure all qualifications approved for funding alongside A-levels and T-levels are high-quality and have a clear purpose and deliver great outcomes, which is the most important thing. Um, therefore, as the post-16 qualification review continues, a new funding approval process will confirm that all qualifications that we continue to fund alongside A-levels and T-levels are both necessary and high quality. Both Ofqual and the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education will have a role in approving these qualifications and they're currently consulting on their approaches at level three. We are unashamed about raising the quality of technical education in this country. Students will benefit from these reforms because they will take qualifications that are high quality and meet the needs of employers, putting them in a strong position to progress onto further study or skilled employment. Where students need more support to achieve a level three qualification in the future, we are working with providers to provide high quality routes onto further study. We have introduced T-level transition programme to support learners to progress onto T-levels. We are also pilot, piloting an academic progression program to test whether there is a gap in provision which supports students to progress to and achieve high quality level three academic qualifications in the future. We are determined to act so that all young people can learn about the exciting high quality opportunities that technical education and apprenticeships can offer. Through Skills and Post-16 Education Act, we are strengthening the law so that all pupils have the opportunity for six encounters with providers of technical education qualifications and apprenticeships as they progress through school in years 8 to 13. For the first time, we are introducing parameters around the duration and content of these counters so that we can ensure they are of high quality. These new requirements will strengthen the original provider's access legislation, the Baker Clause. We'll continue to gather evidence to ensure that our reforms across both technical and academic qualifications are working as we intend. In particular, the unit for future skills, as announced in the Leveling at White paper, we will ensure that across government we are collecting and making available the best possible information to show if courses are delivering the outcome that we want. This will help to give students the best possible opportunity to get high school jobs in local areas. Now, employees will benefit from our reforms, which place them at the heart of the system and will ensure we have technical qualifications that are genuinely grounded in the needs of the workplace. 
The Construction Industry Training Board has said these reforms to technical education are a great opportunity to put things right that industry should seize on. We'll also strengthen and clarify progression routes for academic qualifications to ensure that every funded qualification has a clear purpose, which is vitally important, is of high quality and could le lead to good outcomes. I will touch on some of the questions that was raised um, now um, from across the House. Yes, I I thank the Minister for giving way. Sir Anderson. The Minister has described what the educational plans are, yeah. and those are exactly the plans that the petitioners are concerned about. So, do, has what the Minister heard today give her pause for thought about going ahead with these reforms, and then, as she's just described, looking at the outcomes and assessing them, rather than waiting to see and, and looking again at the reforms? Um, before they're cut, because it will be too late. We will, we'll just won't know how many people are not doing the courses, rather than looking at those people and the educational outcomes of those who are doing the courses and assessing them. Does this debate give her pause for thought about the plans that she has just outlined? I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. And um, we are consulting vigorously, and I was actually going to bring in, in the points here. Um, the Honourable Lady mentioned about colleges in, in her area. Um, I happily meet with colleges, and that goes across the house. Um, you know, my ears are open to this. It's something I'm passionate about. Social mobility is a big thing for me. You know, coming from a regular background, I want to ensure that every child has, you know, um, a great start in life. So my door's open. Thank you. Now, so regarding some of the questions, then. Um, now, I, I see that, you know, um, it, I, Opposite, um, one of the questions was about creating a barrier for disadvantaged and BAME students. Now, we are not withdrawing funding approval from all BTECs and other applied general qualifications. We'll continue to fund BTECs and, uh, and applied general type qualifications as part of a mixed program where there is need and they meet new criteria for quality and necessity. Now, students who take qualifications that are more likely to be replaced have the most to gain from these changes. That's because in future they will take qualifications that are higher quality, putting them in a stronger position to progress onto further skills or skilled employment, because that must be the most important um, outcome, that they have this start in life where they have um, good quality jobs. Now, T-levels equip more young... Yes? Lord Perkins. ...for giving way, but I think her point there somewhat misses um, the tenor of the debate that's gone on so far, because what she's hearing is that a lot of students from more deprived communities, either because of the makeup of the course or because of the fact that it will be more full time and, and mean they're unable to afford to do the course, will not even get onto it. So simply saying, well, at the end of it, if they complete the course, they might have, a diff they might have better study, refute doesn't take into account that lots of them won't even get onto the course in the first place. So, I mean, we hope she'll look into that when she does her review. I thank the um, Honourable Member for his question. Uh, as I said in my background, I'm a, a, a woman who juggles having, um, and know what it's like to have to sort of pay your own way, find to see. Um, I mean, when I did my BTEC, um, I was having to work at the same time to pay my way, you know, coming from a, um, a family who wasn't affluent. So, um, um, not necessarily. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I'll listen to your point and um, I'll take it on board. Now, T-levels will equip more young people with the skills, knowledge and experience necessary to access skilled employment or further technical study, including higher education in related technical areas. Now, we want as many young people to benefit as possible, which is why we have focused on supporting access, which includes introducing T-levels transition programme, flexibilities for SEND students, and removing the English and Maths exit requirements. Now, regarding, there was a question earlier um, about students who have dyslexia now, um, and their frustration about taking exams. Now, this is already covered in the Equalities Act 2010, and it must be considered um, where, whether a student will need reasonable adjustments. Now, those reasonable adjustments can include an extra 25% um, extra time when they're sitting them. Now, regarding Oxbridge, we had um, a question about Oxbridge not accepting T-levels. Firstly, Oxford ad admissions say that BTECs are unlikely to be suitable for their courses, unless taken alongside A-levels. I was looking on their website, 
Fox Ikki today, Fox and they do say that they will be accepting BTEX, and they specifically say that they will not be accepting T-level subjects. So I just want to make sure that you're absolutely correct and accurate in terms of what you're saying. Well, um, if the Honourable Lady had, had let me finish, you'll hear the full context of it, rather than jumping on it. So firstly, Oxford admissions say BTEX are unlikely to be suitable for their courses, unless taken with side A levels. Um, so unless taken with side A levels, it also says um, um, on their website. Secondly, we are continuing to engage with Oxford and Cambridge on accepting T levels. So watch this space. Now, we, we have some questions on other pathways. Now, what sort of qualifications will young people be able to take other than T levels and A levels? Now, on the academic route, students are able to take qualifications similar to the current applied generals in mixed study programmes with A-levels, where they complement the skills and knowledge in A-levels and enhance students' opportunities for progression to further study in related fields of HE. Now, this could include areas with a practical or occupational focus, such as health and social care, STEM, and subjects such as engineering, applied science, and IT. We'll also fund large academic qualifications that would typically make up a student's full programme of study in areas where there is no A-levels and no equivalent T-levels. This could include areas that are well, less well served by A-levels, such as performing arts and creative arts or sports science, where access to HE courses with higher levels of practical content. And we'll also continue to fund the International Baccalaureate Diploma and access to the HE Diploma for adults. Now, on a te technical route, we'll fund... Mira Hobhouse. I have spoken at length and for a long time to Barcelona Bar College, where, where they're teaching a lot of creative subjects. What reassurance can she give my college, bar, uh, my university, Barcelona Bar, about particularly the um, creative BTICs that are going to be scrapped? I thank the Honourable Lady. As I've already said in my speech, um, that where there is not a, um, a, a course which is covered by the T level or A level, you know, the, um, the option is available, as I said, in performing creative arts or sports science. Now, we will fund two groups of technical qualifications alongside T levels for 16 to 9 year olds. The first will be qualifications in the area where there isn't a T level. The second will be specialist qualifications that develop more specialist skills and knowledge that could be acquired through T-levels alone, helping to protect the skill supply in more specialist industries and adding value to the T-level. Now, adults will be able to study a broader range of technical qualifications than the 16 to 9-year-olds, which takes account of prior learning experience, as I've already said. These include technical, technical qualifications that allow entry into applications occupations that are already served by T-levels, such as data technicians or senior production chef. Now, pathway, uh, further on with the pathways, we've made it clear that students will be able to take BTEX and apply general for qualifications alongside A-levels as part of a mixed programme. Our impact assessment recognises that students who take qualifications are more likely uh, to take qualifications, more likely to be defunded, have the most to gain from these changes. Now, regarding questions over um, overlap, um, and for those who have already signed up for courses, um, all qualifications on the final overlap um, will be funded until the current students have um, completed their, their studies. Now, there was also a question about work placement, which is a, a valid question. We put in place substantial support for schools, colleges and employers to help them deliver high quality industry placements for all T levels on a national scale. We are engaging directly with employers through the department's employer engagement team to develop a pipeline of industry placements and we are providing an extensive programme of focused support to help ensure employers and providers are able to deliver placements. We have a national campaign in place to raise the profile of T-levels to an employer audience and we have established T-level employer ambassadors network to engage with others in their industries on T-levels and placements. We also have implemented different delivery models to ensure placements can be delivered by employers across all industries and all locations and I've invested two... Uh, certainly would. I thank the Minister for giving away. But on the issue of work placements, and yeah. it's right that you're doing all the engagement with employers and so forth, hmm. but what about the students that will not be able to take up those placements given their ever-commitment? And this is one of the advantages of studying 
on the BTEC. That 45-day commitment might not be possible, particularly for mature students, possibly like herself. I thank the Honourable Lady. Well, I think, if anything, you could flip that on its head because this is a unique selling point. You know, in, in these work placements, this is where they will gain the soft skills needed in employment and some valuable experience to build up their CVs, which can help secure them um, future employment. Now, so, carry on regarding um, work placements. Um, we have a national campaign to raise a profile of T-levels, as I've, oh, sorry, I've moved on to that. We've also implemented different delivery models to ensure placements can be delivered by employers across all industries and locations. And I've invested over 200 million since 2018 and 19 to support providers in building capacity and networks with employers through the capacity and delivery fund. We'll continue to monitor the delivery of placements and work closely with providers and employers to identify what support they will need going forward to enable them to deliver high quality placements. Yes. I'm grateful to, um, to giving way and for laying out what the government's doing. But at this stage, there are not enough work placements, yeah. are even for the small number of people doing uh, T levels, which is why the government have downgraded them. Much less are the number of the work placements there currently for the sort of expansion she's talking about. So while we hear what they're doing about it, the question I asked her is, in the event that they can't get the number of work placements, what are they actually going to do? I thank the Shadow Minister for his question. Um, I, I, I'm more confident than he is that we will get these placements. I, no, I've seen... Well, no. no, but I've seen firsthand... Um, what the department's doing with the employer engagement. So, um, so watch your space. You can come back to me if, if um, it's the contrary. But, that, but we are finding um, that, you know, it, the evidence is showing that more and more um, employers are actually signing up for this. Now, regarding the question about Prime Minister, our new Prime Minister, now the reforms were mentioned in our manifesto, and it said as follows. Our reforms and investment in education and skills mean more children are leaving school, better equipped for working life, and there will be more high-quality apprenticeships. Now, regarding evidence base, um, the question on evidence base, the in impact assessment published alongside Level 3 government consultation response was published July last year, as I already mentioned, and is on the government website. But the case for change providing evidence of need um, for reform and T levels was published in July 2016, and streamlining qualifications at Level 3 was published in March 2019. Now, we have an opportunity to put things right that industry could seize on, and we, we can also strengthen and clarify progression routes for academic qualifications, as I've already said. Now, I'd like to thank all colleagues from across the House. Um, I give away to the gentleman. I thank the Minister for giving way on the point she's making about putting things right. I wonder if she will comment on this government's scrapped education maintenance allowance in 2010, I believe. They haven't replaced that. It goes in with the theme of defunding, the term defunding education. I wonder if she'll come in, because the data pointed out that because of that £30, um, 30 pound allocation was scrapped, fewer younger, younger people went into further education. I thank the Honourable um, Gentleman for his question. But I, I think you'll also find that um, more people from disadvantaged backgrounds are going into education than ever before. Thank you. And the uh, uh, question from the Honourable I'm, Lady. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. And forgive me, as I had a problem with mishearing before, I may have misheard again. But has, I don't think I've heard her mention the word choice mm. once. And the, the, the central argument made by all sides in this debate is around the reduction of choice. Now, choice, we've heard for many years from Conservative ministers and different Conservative governments, choice is fundamental to their philosophy, yet here they seem to be reducing choice, and that is going to come at the cost of the most disadvantaged, because yes, there will be a few BTECs remaining, but the vast majority of pupils are going to be forced into either A-levels or T-levels or just to go straight into the workplace uh, with very few qualifications. So please, can she address that point in terms of how they are decimating choice by defunding BTEX in this way? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, <coughs> Honourable Lady. Um, I completely disagree because to me, it, what, well, the most important thing is outcome. And, you know, there is choice there. You know, we, 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 we've said if people... Uh, 
let me finish. Thank you. Um, so there is choice. I mean, look at apprenticeships. To me, the most important thing is the outcome, as I said. And if people can have better quality and, and higher paying jobs, that, that is a better start in life than taking courses which don't have the same outcomes. Now, I'm going to conclude. Now, I'd like to thank all colleagues across the House for their contributions today. And it's been a real pleasure to discuss the importance of developing our skills system. Transforming post-16 education and skills is at the heart of our plan to build back better and level up the country by ensuring that students everywhere have the access to qualifications that will give them the skills to succeed, as I just already mentioned. T-levels are a critical step in the quality of the technical offer. They have been co-designed with over 250 leading employers and are uh, based on the best international examples of technical education. But these reforms will only have their full benefit if we streamline and address the complexities and variable quality of the broader three-level qualification. Now, as a former BTEC student myself, I understand the benefits of technical education. Um, I will continue. Um, and I want to reassure um, everyone across the House that we are not re withdrawing funding um, for all BTECs. Now, students will be able to take BTECs and apply general qualifications alongside A-levels as part of a mixed programme where those qualifications meet the new quality and other criteria. We want every student to have confidence that every qualification on offer is high quality. That's so important rather than choice. High quality which will lead them into jobs. And to understand what skills and knowledge... Order. And we'll Let understand the what... Speak. Thank you, Chairman. And to understand what skills and, and knowledge that qualification will provide them and where it will take them, and our reforms will deliver that. Thank you. The court over to respond and wind up the debate. Thank you, Sir Mark. And can I just start by thanking every one of these speakers today? We've heard incredible speeches from honourable members and honourable friends, Birkenhead, Luton South, Lucian Deptford, Putney, uh, Stockport, um, Milne Valley, Bath, um, Taunton Dean, Twickenham, and some incredibly powerful interventions by many other members. Now, the petition that was signed by over 100,000 people was about preserving and protecting student choice. And unfortunately, this is something that I do not believe the Minister has addressed in her response. Um, it is about cutting funding and reducing choice for our young people, the very same people who we say we want to, or many of us do, want to ensure that they have a future choice and opportunity. Now, we've all heard the transformative impact that BTEX can have on the lives and vocational training, including yourself, uh, uh, Sir Mark, and, and many others. Now, nobody is saying that T-levels are not the way to go, but it's, again, it's about having the different options and choices, and that's just something that the Minister hasn't chosen to acknowledge in all of this. And I do hope that she recognises the strength of feeling from across the House, actually. This isn't even party political. We've heard from members from all parties expressing the difficult. We know that there are students from disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly students who are, have a special education need or a disability or from ethnic minority backgrounds. I don't believe the minister fully addressed how these new, these new qualifications are going to be supporting disabled students. I, did, I don't, and if she did cover that, I'd ask that she writes to me to update me, but I do not believe that those points uh, were raised. I think going forward, this is an issue that we have to keep pressing the government on. I do hope there will be some transparency when they are reviewing this. They are involving the leaders and they are involving the, those campaign organisations and trade unions and student bodies in their review of these new T-levels because actually, at the end of the day, I'm not sure the minister really does get it. As somebody that has studied BTEX herself, I'm just not sure that she fully gets this. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 592642 relating to BTEC qualifications. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary no. Ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order. Sitting is adjourned. Thank you.
proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.